Oh, and now apparently it's working? Yes? No? Okay, it's working on the live stream, so I'll keep talking. Yeah, but I also have something that started... (laughs) Now it's really working. Um, (laughs) That started actually from the astronomy division, Um, but a number of other divisions at NSF have picked it up, and it's a little flyer on how not to get funded at NSF. So if you're interested in this, feel free to pick it up. And it, it's kind of amusing, but it does encompass quite a few things that are issues when um, people try to write a proposal, especially junior faculty when you're writing it for the first time and you don't have that much experience yet. So, um, but in the meantime, I'll just let the others introduce themselves. You want to see that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Hi, I'm Virginia Paysauer. I eventually found my way to the old Nimbus building, was very proud of myself, and then found out it was no longer there. So <laughs> I'm here now. Sorry about that. Um, so I am the biomathematics program manager um, at the Army Research Office, and we are a, an agency that a lot of people don't know about, but I think um, we're pretty cool because it's, it's quite small. We try to fund really good basic research internationally. We have offices in London, Tokyo, um, and South America. And we fund usually three-year um, grants, like $120,000 per year um, max. Um, and we also have um, grants for instrumentation, which isn't typically something that a lot of mathematicians might need, but some in math, bio, and other more applied areas yeah, do. Have, there's no funding for instrumentation. Is that right? Yeah, <laughs> we have awards every year for instrumentation. And usually I'm looking for people to, to give awards to because they usually give each program manager at least one award. So half the time I end up taking somebody else's, some other program manager's um, uh, proposals to fund since I don't have any of my own. Um, and we also fund conferences. We love to fund workshops on new ideas, get people um, talking about new things that we, put, we can potentially fund either as single investigator um, research, or we have large um, MURI, multidisciplinary university research initiatives that are um, about between six and seven million dollars over five years, and those are really large, um, really um, hopefully hard-hitting projects. We always look for good ideas from everywhere, from industry, from government scientists, from academics. Um, and, and we also have STIRS, which are um, short-term investigative research projects. They're nine-month, um, $50,000 uh, uh, projects that are intended for um, people who are new to the, our agency or um, are doing something that's super high-risk. We like high-risk projects, but doing something that's really risky and we don't know if we want to commit three years' worth of funding to it. Um, but so I, as I said, I'm the biomathematics program manager. We have programs in probability and statistics, in uh, numerical analysis, in network science of various types. We're getting very really into um, social science, um, both empirically or you know in terms of modeling and, and other types of, um, of work. And um, we've got about 45 program managers in different fields and like to do very interdisciplinary kinds of things and co-fund projects. And um, I don't know if you said how to find out information, you know. <laughs> well, maybe, I guess everyone probably knows. But, um, but yeah, you can go online and look up Army Research Office and um, find, and actually under the business tab, there's a broad agency announcement. Um, the first thing under that is broad agency announcements and that has all of our programs and what we're interested in right now and how to contact us. So I guess that's it for now. Okay, good morning. Um, I will, I'm Shushmita Data. I have introduced myself yesterday, but uh, for you, all of you that were not there yesterday, I am a professor in Department of Bioinformatics and Biostatistics at University of Louisville. And uh, I am here beca- um, because I have been successful sometimes in obtaining grants, so I don't have any money to give you, but (laughs) I I can give you users' perspectives, how to be successful. So that's 
I have prepared some slides, however, um, if you want to have it, just uh, email me, I will send those to you. And I will just briefly go through those, that what it takes to be successful. Uh, what I found out, um, especially NIH, I do get funding from NSF, NIH, both. I thought NSF is covered by Marianne, so I better talk about NIH um, uh, today. So for NIH research proposal, what I found out, that you need at least 1.5 months to prepare a good proposal. You got to be very serious. You don't want to, it's a lot of work to uh, submit a proposal. The mundane things of making a proposal, it's uh, so um, large that you don't want to do a casual job. It's really not worth it. Once you figure out you have a solid project in mind, then only you write a good proposal. If it's collaborative proposal, then you better have your collaborators on board before time. You don't wait until the last moment. It doesn't work that way, really. Um, so, and then before you plan to write a proposal, figure out which uh, specific institution it should go to, which research program it should go to, and then prepare an abstract for your proposal, call the program officer, ask whether what you are thinking, whether that institution is good for the proposal or not. Um, you, you have to pay attention to which study section it goes to. Uh, it's very important to be successful. And then um, for uh, what you can do, you can go to an IH web page, and uh, you, all of you will have some basic idea that which uh, big, bigger institute it should, the proposal should go to, but it has all sorts of specialization built into it. It's called IRG, uh, the review board, and then within that there are several study sections. Which study section it will go to if you are uh, writing for our proposals, the research proposals, basic research proposals. Most of the time those are standing committees, standing study section. It's easier to deal with that because you know uh, which uh, study section it goes to, it has standing members. Some of them, they, uh, I mean, it's not standing study section members, but they do invite specialized people. However, you know uh, the basic, who is the chair of that committee, so on and so forth. So why you should do all that? Because you want to feel the pulse, because ultimately your proposal is getting reviewed by four or five people there, some primary, some secondaries, and uh, you have to, it, it's better for you if you know them somewhat in terms of their likings, their research interest, because it's human being, you know how are they going to rate your proposal. So it's always better to do some more homework than you think you need to. So now um, when the, and you need to know how the proposals are scored. Uh, scope, if for NIH proposals these days, it's uh, one to nine. Uh, that's how they score it. Lower, the better. And ultimately, it gets multiplied by 10. So the you, you score like 10, tw uh, 12, 15, or uh, 20, or 30, or whatever it is, okay? And there are different categories you get uh, scored on uh, like significance, investigator, innovation approach, environments, so on and so forth. But, but there is an overall score as well. You get scored on all of those. The overall score is not the average of all those uh, uh, specific sections. It's the overall feeling about your proposal. And uh, then you get scored. Um, it reflects the individual uh, criterion, however, it's not the average of all those things. So uh, what I figured out in order to be really successful, 
you have to show your excellence, of course, in terms of methods or uh, applicability, whatever it is. But the first page of the proposal where you write the summary and all that, that has to be really, really well written. You have to make a case that why should that institution will support you? What, what's the goal, what's the aim, overall aim of that particular NIH, uh, uh, RFP or whatever it is that they are asking for? whether your proposal is in line with that. It's a mission, overall mission of that uh, institute, whether it matches with your goal. And you have to be really, really excited about your own work. If you are not excited enough about your own work, you cannot convince others, plain and simple. It definitely comes across. Yes. <laughs> so um, these are the very broad things that I wanted to tell you. Rest of it, you will just ask some questions. I will see what I can do. Thank you. I guess we're opening up the floor for questions now. OK. Anyone have a question? I will run to the microphone to you. Since Sue Smita gave you an idea of some of the NIH rules, um, one thing, if you come into NSF and I not sure who from here is primarily from math, maybe primarily from bio, maybe kind of a combination of the two at this point. Um, there are different programs you can come into. You can certainly come into mathematical sciences where we do have the program in mathematical biology. If you're in statistics, you might come directly to statistics depending on what you're doing there. You might go directly to biology and we do a lot of co-review with biology. So it's not as if you submit directly to one program and no other program ever looks at you, they may, depending on the situation. So I always advise people to talk to the program officers. Unlike NIH, you will have absolutely no clue, if we've done our jobs right, who reviewed your proposal. So there are no standing study sections. Um, the panels are formed each year independently. So it is unlikely that you will really know who reviewed yours. And frankly, in years, in the years I've been there, and it's now been about 10, usually when people guess who reviewed their proposal, they're wrong. And usually when they guess who downgraded their proposal, even if it was a reviewer, they're wrong. So it's always very interesting to kind of see the dynamics. But I would definitely agree with you that one of the best things to do is really sell what you want to do in the project summary. Because reviewers read a lot of proposals. And it takes them a while to get through. And if they don't capture, if their interest is not captured, then a lot of times it's more challenging to make the case further down the line. If you don't make the case until page 12, by then they've probably, their brain is kind of burning out. So, I just wanted to uh, say something. Uh, just to remind, that since we, some of the panelists didn't meet everybody yesterday, this is actually very broad mathematical sciences, right. so we really don't have an emphasis on, there's not very many math biology people here, so it's okay. very broad here. And also, there, also, Marianne went and wasn't here last night, but today at lunchtime, we're, and, we're, and I'll, we'll write the topics up, but there's going to be a, uh, a table. So who wants to sit with Marianne or Virginia, or, you know, you can uh, <laughs> sit at a table with Marianne so you can ask if you've got something that you weren't able to ask here. So, okay. um, and can I ask you to do one more thing? Um, there are a number of people, a number of women, who are at primarily teaching colleges. So the sort of proposals, because there are different types of proposal. Right. So at NSF, if you're at primarily a teaching college, um, there is what is called an RUI application, which means basically you get to submit an additional five pages about what the impact might be to your institution if your research was funded. Now, one of the things, at least within the Division of Mathematical Sciences, is there is not a separate line of funding for this. So you do get reviewed with everyone else. But the expectation is that, given that you are often teaching three or maybe four classes a semester, um, what we do give instructions to the reviewers about is that you, shouldn't, you should expect the research to be good, but you shouldn't necessarily expect somebody at an 
primarily undergraduate institution to complete as much research in three years as somebody who is at a research one institution and is teaching maybe a, you know one and two load instead so um, but if you have any questions and actually since this is as Suzanne mentioned not just math bio even though admittedly two of us from the <laughs> are <laughs> more in math bio at, but um, there are a lot of different program officers I would certainly encourage you to contact the programs and the program officers if you have questions and I am happy to like try to put you in contact with people at NSF if you are in other programs like analysis, applied math, probability, topology, anything. Can you just say one more thing? Yeah, um, as I think I said, we only have about 45 maybe program managers and we're all right in the same area. Any, any of us can get any, any white paper. We ask, we would like to get white papers first. Um, and I have a special just like two page or less five question Thing that I usually ask for, but it can. It's nice also to get white paper because then you, it's easier to pass it along to other people and see if other people are, are interested. White paper is just a is just a um, a pre it just something instead of just calling and saying what you are um, interested in doing, it's something just on paper or by by email. So I don't know. I actually don't know. Is it you don't ask for that? Yeah, we, we want white papers because we don't want you to spend your time, waste your time writing a proposal, which <laughs> is, is, you know, is very time consuming if we're not interested in it. And we also want to make sure that it gets to the right person and that all the different people that might be interested have a chance to, to look at it. And usually when someone calls me and is talking about their research, I think I have it and then I'll go talk to someone else about it. I'm like, it's about this, but I... <laughs> I can't tell you can't tell you much detail. So it's really nice for us to have something written down. I actually did not realize that yeah. white papers are not. NSF usually does not encourage white papers. Okay. Well, that's why I said for me, we actually in our broad agency announcement it has something about white papers, and I think it's like five page long or something. I don't know anybody in my at at Army Research Office that has done that that asked for that. I just I mean I I got it from one of my I got a. Just these five questions from one of my fellow program managers, and that's what I use. I say, don't, you know, hopefully don't spend more than half an hour on this. But I just ask, you know, what is the question you're trying to answer? And it's just, you know, something that I would, I would give you these questions if you emailed me or called me and said you were interested. But, you know, what is the, what is the research question you're trying to answer? How are, you know, what is the approach you're going to use? How is the approach unique? How is it going to potentially benefit the field? And for me, that could be math and or biology. Hopefully it's both. And then how might it potentially sometime in the future, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, be of benefit to the Department of Defense? And that's one thing I was going to say is that I think it's kind of cool about our agency. We have a small amount of money compared to, a very small amount of money compared to NSF and NIH. But we try to make the, the best use of it by funding really good, high-risk, basic research. And then from the get-go, we have to have um, support from some government person. Usually it's going to be someone in the military and often in the Army. But we have to get um, three, a, three academic reviewers and one government reviewer. And there's no kind of panel. We just ask for reviews. So we end up having to get someone from the military usually involved from the get-go. And hopefully that will help take the research as it um, progresses. And they can, they can take it and, and you know, go to the next step or um, see that it's transitioned to something that that the military and hopefully, you know, civilians, because most things that the military does ends up being a benefit to the civilians, like lasers and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah. So white papers are very useful for that. Yeah. Yes. And how many competitions do you have for you? We do not have any. We do not have um, deadlines for our normal grants, and we never know exactly when money's coming in. So I always say, the sooner you get, the sooner you get me something, the sooner I can get it reviewed and have it ready to go when money gets there. And oftentimes we get. We've actually just been told we have to spend a whole bunch of money by the end of May, potentially June. So now we're all frantically trying to get <laughs> proposals in. But usually we need to have, like a lot of times um, our director will say, if you've got something ready to go now, we've got money. So, um, yeah, that's, a, of course. You mean, you, when you say resubmit. Oh, yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly, certainly. Yeah. Well, I mean, I wouldn't, <laughs> you can, I wouldn't, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I mean, usually, you know, of course, we try to m figure out what the issue was, and, you know, and, and, um, and oftentimes things, I've talked about these STIRs, these short-term investigative research proposals, oftentimes regular 
three-year grants get converted into a STIR if there's some big problem, but I think it seems promising. And we'll say, well, we only have to get one reviewer for that. It's really easy to get through. Why don't you, get, why don't you work for nine months, show us what you can do, and then we'll see if we can convert it to a three-year grant. sort of a comment and a question um, for Susmita. And um, one thing that strikes me, I was just looking up on the web to see the name, is that NIH has this mechanism, the K25, and I don't know mm -hmm. if you know anybody who's gone for it, but it's specifically for people with qu strong quantitative Carrie. training mm -hmm. who are interested in converting to do research in NIH relevant areas. It's for mm -hmm. faculty members and it covers like seventy-five to $100,000 in salary per year. Um, so I don't, I don't it is usually, I mean, from medical school, people do apply for that. It's a cool, very nice grant. If you are in early stages of your career, this career grants, I mean, K awards are really cool. I mean, they, they give you so much support um, for a while. But if you wait for a while, you are not eligible for that. So, really? Yeah. Uh, that's what I thought. <laughs> Sorry, one of um, my former colleagues, um, who I knew for many years, applied after he was a tenured professor. And he was purely in mathematics at the time and got the K-25 and then shifted into things that were more relevant to NIH and spent five years at a completely different institution. So I don't know if they've changed the rules, but I've known a number of people who um, were definitely further along. For the K-25, not necessarily for all the, yeah. Um, yeah. So some of them are for more junior people, but some of them definitely, if you check them out, you could be more senior and still, because sometimes NIH really wants to get people in who are trained quantitatively and who have not been doing things that are relevant to their mission. So. <laughs> Okay, and um, I wanted to ask, uh, just uh, tell you that you are in this business for a long haul. So if you get rejected, nothing to be emotional about. That don't give up. Just keep trying. It works. Eventually it will work. But uh, make sure that whatever you are learning from your rejection, the review or report, there is nothing to be, I mean, you just think they, they are totally wrong, you know, they don't understand. Don't look at it that way. Just uh, look at it in a very positive perspective. You can learn from each and every comment. Um, initially, you may think that they are stupid, they don't understand your proposal, no, nothing. <laughs> but, uh, but just give some time. You, you will see that you can really turn into your own advantage. Um, and uh, it's a very good idea when you are starting your career, just finish up your proposal or way ahead of time so that you can let it uh, get reviewed by one of your senior successful colleagues. So that, that really helps. Let somebody else read your proposal. And then, okay. And if you get one um, success story, that doesn't mean that you will be successful all the time. So it's nothing to get really excited about <laughs> when you just, you know, six people said yes to your work. That's, that's okay. Next six people may not care. So it's... <laughs> Nothing to get too excited about. So be really less emotional about this grant business. Okay. I have to say I have a very good friend who says six time is the charm. Aww. So <laughs> study section available online. Could I find yeah. Yes, if it's a standing study section, you get to see, but you are not supposed to contact them. If you contact them, that's it. They will not review your proposal anymore. So you have the information. Mm -hmm. Just uh, try to have that, uh, you know, I mean, 
make yourself comfortable. You know this people research area, this and that. So, uh, but you cannot contact them. Okay. okay. Thank you. So. Um, the other question is for the um, K award, um, like K25. Um, do I need to, um, I guess I need to identify a mentor on that grant, right? Um, Usually, uh, for K25, uh, you need to. I'm not 100% sure, but uh, when you I can. Online, I think I, the NCI would defer to Cancer yeah. Institute, and they wanted a cancer mentor. Mm -hmm. I think that's too broadly. Yeah. So then, um, for that person, um, do um do I um, like uh, for the applicant uh, do they need to um, specify how much like uh, time or um, the effort they were involved in this uh, uh, grant? Like, uh, um, does this award also support their time? No. 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 Usually not. No. 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 Not usually. They they don't support the mentor. Yeah. So kind of a general question for everybody. I was just wondering about your opinion on federal versus private foundation funding, and what are the differences between applying for those two different kinds of, of funding opportunities? Uh, we don't know that much. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think overall <laughs> this panel doesn't know that much, but I know you know certainly like the Simons Foundation is offering funds for different things, and I would my personal opinion is explore all the options that you can, and um, connect with as many people at these different organizations as you can, because I think that sometimes the private foundations have a lot more flexibility in terms of how they review what they fund than some of the government agencies that have certain rules that I think are much more specified. I mean, you can see just among the government agencies, for example, DOD in some ways is probably the most flexible because you can um, provide money if you think something is a reasonable idea. NSF wants to get reviews. We're kind of middle of the pack. Um, we can still, I can still recommend something for funding that a panel thought was n not competitive. If I make a very strong justification to my division director why I think it should be funded, in fact, we had a program officer who once, I remember not too long ago, did this, and ultimately the PI won multiple awards for the research, even though the panel thought the proposal was not competitive. Um, NIH tends to be tougher in the sense that they go very much by scores. They've got a little bit of flexibility near the boundary but not as much because they've got an additional review, which means that in each institute it has to go through the institute's council. So um, they tend to be much more tied to how the review goes. But I think it's fair. There are a number of private organizations out there that are interested in funding mathematics, and I think you should keep an eye out whenever possible. There are much, I, in my opinion, harder to find when they have calls. But if you keep an eye on um, what's going on with some of these organizations, um, depending on what you're doing, you might hit a time when they're really interested in the area. Um, I was just going to say real, real quick, as far as, I, as far as we're concerned, I mean, it's fine for you to submit this, you know, essentially the same idea to different, you know, to the private foundation and us or whatever, right? You obviously can't get funded for the same thing twice, but there's, you know, it kind of helps spread the, you know, well, it, it uh, makes your chances of, you know, find somebody who's interested greater, right? So, I mean, for us, that's, I mean, it doesn't look suspicious, you know, or anything, so. Okay, so I have had uh, funding from non, I've had NSF funding, I've had um, non-government organization funding, and the way I've gotten it is usually through a collaborative thing. So I had funding from the uh, American Chemical, the Petroleum Research Fund of the American Chemical Society, but I was working with a geologist. And so it had to be, because getting, you know, I mean, math and stats, it's really hard to convince someone that, you know, whatever thing I do, you know, as Richard Feynman used to write, gnu nu nu alpha beta gamma, right? Like, this doesn't make any sense to anyone. So it, that's where the interdisciplinary part really comes in. And then I've also had funding with a chemical, 
um, engineering professor uh, from a private um, sort of a um, oil field infrastructure company where what we did was statistics we had we got their data and worked on it but if I had approached them it would have made absolutely no sense so I think that that talk about interdisciplinary stuff I think that's the way and it's the other discipline that usually has those connections so that what other Actually, one one more thing on the NS. Uh, I mean, uh, the of these, I've so I've. <laughs> this is not to like. Oh, how great! I've I've never had an NSF grant rejected, but, <laughs> but, I I I don't put anything in unless I'm, I'm I'm a perfectionist, which also means I don't have a huge huge output. Like you know, I have to be convinced. But the way that I got started was, I I got successful grant proposals that I looked at. Because that was my, if I don't know what the finished product looks like, I don't know what it's supposed to look like. So I had my PhD advisor's proposal. Um, I had a couple of proposals. And once I got, and people are, you know, you can go to the NSF website, just like for, to the, you know, all of this is open information, right? You can go and you can see what sorts of things are getting funded. And, you know, if someone works in an area that's similar to what you work in, people are pretty open about, you know, this is kind of like, oh, you, you were successful. Can you help me? Or, you know, can I get some input from you? And, I mean, this is, it's a small world, right? So I, I found that, you know, I just did it the first time. And then once I got the hang of it, you know, now, now I have my own model. But that would be, you know, I think that will be very helpful when you're just starting out is you want to see what a successful proposal looks like. So, okay, next question. A couple of comments that if you're somebody who's also looking for uh, funding for outreach activities, you might look at quite a different thing. So definitely private foundations, but also like the Association for Women in Science sometimes gives small grants. If you're looking for money to do um, research experience for undergraduates, of course, you could try to get a site grant or a supplement on a grant through the National Science Foundation or uh, look at the National Security Agency. But also MAA has a a grant for small, very small grants for working with a small number of students. And uh, so you can look into that. And I think actually that's funded through NSF, actually, right? So they, it's, I think, in that right? They have an NSF grant and they give them out to, is, is that correct, Marian? <laughs> yeah, anyway, they give out, there's one that actually for they that give one. out small, small grants, for like if you need money to fund three students to work with you or something like that. So, yeah. So there's different things you can look for, you know, but um, outreach is a very interesting thing you can get some money for these days, so. Um, the other thing is travel, especially when you're more junior, either graduate student postdoc or assistant faculty member, um, because a lot of the societies are given grants for travel, and they'll advertise it on the travel websites. So one of the things that you can often do is at least get the opportunity to attend conferences or workshops at places like Nimbus or um, some of the mathematical institutes, as well as some of the major um, meetings of the societies. You all may not have an answer to this question, but um, I work at a small teaching school, and some of the things that I've, so I'm interested in inquiry-based learning, and I have a grant through the Academy of Inquiry-Based Learning, um, but it doesn't cover any sort of materials. Do you know anywhere that I could look for a grant that would help cover buying, you know, small portable whiteboards, things like that? Just any ideas of where to look would be good. So I'm not sure about how much materials might be covered, but I would definitely look into programs in the Division of Undergraduate Education and see if there are any options there. And um, I, I can give you a name or two there, too, later. But um, actually, if any of you want a name, the name I'm thinking of, who I think is still in the division, who's a mathematician, is Lee Zia, L-E-E-Z-I-A. Um, but I'd just look through their programs. They have been updating their programs r relatively recently over the past year or so. So things are changing. And um, it's better to probably ask someone directly there if they know of anything specific. Um, when you 
submit a grant, what kind of feedback do they give you? I mean, you said something about getting a score, but I mean, do they tell you exactly sort of what issues they had? So if you submit to NSF, and I think this is true for NIH, you get the feedback from the reviewers. So you get their full reviews. Um, NSF does not edit them unless the reviewer inadvertently gives away um, information about, for example, somebody else who applied saying that, wow, I think this grant was good, but nothing compared to Mr. Smith. Um, <laughs> then, then we will delete it. But um, otherwise, you get everything completely word by word, verbatim. You also get, if it goes through a panel, you get information about the panel discussion. So about what they considered the pros, the cons, things they think needed to be strengthened if they had issues with the um, proposal. So you do get a decent amount of information. Of course, you're always welcome to talk to the program officer, too, after the fact. I have to admit, I tend to let um, PIs digest after I know the um, if they've been declined, after I know something's gone out. Because, for example, a few weeks ago, I declined someone, and I got a response within about 10 minutes. Um, that was very upset. And um, fortunately, I was in panels, and I just said, can we talk in about a week? And by then, things had diff diffused, and the PI was willing to have a conversation about the back and forth. And that PI will be coming in probably for the next round of competition. And I think there are a lot of things in that case that could be done. And I encouraged the PI to come back. But um, you do get a fair bit of information. And a lot of times, if you're not sure what was meant by someone, we try to get them to clarify as much as they can. But sometimes it's confusing. Um, the program officer may t be able to help. Um, so I usually give all the, the PIs, all, the, all of the reviews anonymized. It's not like we're supposed to or anything. But usually, bef until I, before I decide whether I'm going to fund something or not, I ask for their response to the reviews. I mean, there's no, so for us, it's, you get a, a accept, decline, or other from the reviewers. And I've funded stuff that got like, there's so, said you have to get four reviews, but sometimes you have to get a lot more people to agree to do reviews in order to get, actually get four back. Please, please do reviews if you say you're going to do them. <laughs> um, and so I had three declines, I think, like one accept and two others or something for this one, um, one proposal from England. And it was really excellent. And I said, I want, to, I'm gonna, I want to fund this thing, but I do feel like I need to get you know, her response to these. So basically, for, for me, people, um, I guess they aren't upset because they don't know yet whether they're going to get, get um, well, and, 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 and I try not to ask for proposals unless I really want to fund it. You know, if, and, but, but basically, yeah, the, 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 respond, the, the reviews, getting the reviews gives them a chance to respond to it, let me know whether the reviewer's comments are on, you know, on target or not. If they are, how are they going to address them? And if not, then, you know, I feel, feel uh, better about the, about possibly funding it because, you know, I get stuff in area, in biological areas all over the map. And I'm a theoretical ecologist. And I don't know much about <laughs> all these, a lot of different areas. So the reviews are, I think, are important to help them. Even if they get all accepts, you know, there's always something that's going to be um, useful for, for people to get um, out of the reviews. Okay, for uh, NIH, how it works, uh, if your proposal has been decided that it's not even worth getting reviewed, it's, uh, we, usually it gets decided. Do you, do you want to explain triage? <laughs> <laughs> not in too much details, <laughs> but uh, that, that said it's triaged. It's not going to get discussed at all. As everybody unanimously decided it's not even worth um, discussing that proposal for the study section. Then you don't really get much review out of it. But if it makes it for discussion, in that case uh, it will be scored. Uh, you get a summary statement, overall feeling about your proposal. It's very important. And then you get the individual reviews. Everything is there. And the idea is that you really <coughs> Um, go through it, uh, it got scored. So you should, uh, as uh, an individual submitting for the first time, it gets scored, you should feel happy, even if you don't make it. 
Um, so it go through the r reviews very carefully, line by line, and then you have formed an opinion that how to revise it. The next thing you should do is to talk to the program officer, make an appointment for a certain time when sh he or she has a, a time slot for you, and then uh, then they usually the program officers they read the reviews along with you and go through line by line. I have seen very committed program officers; they do read with you uh, and then gives you very good um, rebuttal strategies, basically. And then uh, those are the things you should learn and try to do it. Never do any hasty job with grant proposal. It never works. So after you listen to him next time around, you address all those things according to what you have learned from him and your own opinion about it. And then it usually you are successful. NSF career grant, and uh, if someone is math and bio, then what would be the advantage of submitting to either one or the other? Okay, um, so I would definitely, um, so the career award is for somebody who is not yet tenured, who's on a tenure track position or the equivalent, depending on um, if you're in a regular math department, for example, versus some people come in as tenure track equivalent if they've gotten a job in, say, a med school. Um, we do do a lot of co-review on um, between math and bio, so if you're bridging those two disciplines, but what we always advise is put the proposal in to the lead program that is going to be impacted the most by whatever you are planning on doing. So if it looks like it's gonna be bio, put it into them first, With but you can then choose a program in such as mathematical biology as a secondary program, or vice versa. If you think the math is first and the bio is secondary, flip the order. Um, in fact, let's see, this year we are recommending um, three career awards in math biology. All of them are being co-funded by some other division. Um, so we do work a lot across divisions. Math biology is probably one of the main programs that tends to work primarily with either bio or bioengineering. Um, but in general, no matter what area you're in, when you're putting in proposals, think about what your work will have the most impact in. If it's topology, put it into topology. If it's statistics, put it into statistics. Um, you need to think about where your proposal has the best chance. So, um, and a lot of times when you're trying to cross disciplines, it's more of a challenge, but in that case, I encourage you to talk to program officers on, in, in the different programs, because even within the Division of Mathematical Sciences, for example, we co-review. So we've co-funded with, MathBio has co-funded with probability, we've co-funded with statistics, we, you know. So people talk about the proposals that come in that seem to be competitive. So talk to the program officers, see if it's relevant, and see if you should select um, other secondary programs. And by the way, I would do that judiciously as opposed to I've certainly gotten proposals that select a primary program and then list every possible program that they think might be relevant. That doesn't work well. 